today I'd like to just continue our study in the in the Sermon on the Mount, and just by way of like introducing this topic again, I just want to refresh everyone's mind because I think the more we have a good foundation on where Jesus is headed with this information, the more it can have an impact on our life. And and so I, I just want to read to you a passage that I think is pivotal in and how Jesus is using as examples things like uh, we saw last week, uh, adultery, the week before that, anger, and we're going to pick up a couple of other subjects today. But this is where it starts. It starts in, in Matthew 5, 17. And I just want to read this text here as we begin, right? It says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. And that phrase, law and prophets, I hope by now you guys recognize it is the equivalent of Jesus saying the scriptures. The law and the prophets, along with wisdom literature, was the way the Old Testament was broken down. And, um, and so, as a result, when Jesus says, don't think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets, what he's saying is, don't think that I am going to disregard this whole history of what God has been doing and saying in the Word. He goes, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So, in your head... You have to recognize that Jesus, in his mission, right, this ministry that Jesus is engaging in now, he's saying, I'm going to come to fulfill everything that the Father has already disclosed. Not only that, he goes on to say this. He says, I, I tell you the truth, unless, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So that's saying to you and me, the Bible, as we know it, is not going to go away. The scriptures, as we know it, there is this intended purpose for them, and Jesus says, I'm going to accomplish everything about this. That is his mission. Why he has come is to proclaim this kingdom of heaven and make sure that everything here is accomplished. But then notice what he says right after that. He says, anyone. See, he's saying, I'm not going to come to break any of this law. I'm not going to abolish it. But he says, anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same, they will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called what? Great in the kingdom of heaven. Who's great in the kingdom of heaven? Well, the text is saying here, those who practice and teach these commands. And then he says this, for I, tell, for, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So when you read this text, I want you to understand that the, the whole text there is is about Jesus' mission, but more importantly than that, he's saying this law and the prophets, which is the declared will of God for you and me, Jesus says, I've come to accomplish everything that this was intended to convey. And consequently, those of you who are now following me, disciples who have come and crossed this line of faith and saying, I'm going to fix my eyes on Jesus. I'm going to walk this walk of faith with him. Jesus says, you now, if you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven, then you are going to practice and teach the very commands that I am teaching you. This fulfillment, this intended purpose for all of the will of God, the more we align ourselves with that, it says that we will be great in the kingdom of heaven. So how does God define, you know, great in this kingdom of heaven? We said, great are those, right, whose hearts and minds are being shaped by this word of God. I mean, that's an important fact because otherwise we reduce our faith to just mere rituals, you know, some spiritual practices and disciplines that we engage in. And we think that that's what God is really after. But what God is really after is this. It is the transformation that's going to take place in a person's mind and their hearts because it's in that position that we're really going to begin to understand what God's will is. And as a result of that, he says, 
you'll experience this level of peace even in a world that is broken on so many different levels. So, having said that, the result then that Jesus is after, if you heard, it says, it says, your righteousness then needs to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Because the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they were, they were taking these commandments of God and beginning to redefine them in such a way that it became something that was more external than internal. And that's why when Jesus began to give us some instruction, right, he, he begins to say, you've heard it said, thou shalt not murder. But I tell you that if anyone is angry with his brother, calls him a fool, he's in dangers of the, of the fires of hell. In other words, he's going to be judged for that. And then he gives that little story. He says, now you could be on your way to service. You're on your way to the temple. You have an offering that you're going to bring. And there you remember that your brother has something against you. It's not that you have something against your brother. Notice the text, it says your brother has something against you. But you're conscious of that. God's saying you'd be better off leaving your offering and then going and being reconciled with your brother. Because the real intent behind thou shalt not kill is that God wanted us to be reconciled at peace with one another. So it's not enough to just check the box then and say, hey, I haven't killed anybody. Because the real intent of the law was to go deeper than just that one commandment. And when you can find that throughout the places of scripture where God says, if all I was looking for was the blood of bulls and goats, he says, I'm not, I'm not after that. I'm after your heart. I'm, I'm after you and I being in fellowship with one another and that love for me being translated into love for those around you. And it's the same thing with adultery, right? Adultery wasn't something that was external so that I'm not just sleeping around. I'm not viewing, you know, um, the opposite sex through this one lens of my own personal desires and passions, God's saying, no, 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 let me, let me tell you that I, this is a matter of the heart. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the, um, the place where you have to get this right. So the theme then is gonna continue for us in the rest of this passage in Matthew chapter five, because what God is really after is this an internal commitment to God's will over against an external compliance. This theme that Jesus is gonna say, you've heard it was said, but I say to you, is, God, is Jesus's way of really getting us to go a little bit deeper into what God's intent was, the, the fulfillment, the accomplishment of what God really seeks to desire in the lives of those who follow me. So this theme that Jesus consistently emphasizes is that God is after this internal commitment, not just an external you know, compliance. So we're gonna talk a little bit about truth telling. We're gonna be talking about retaliation. We're gonna talk about what is true love. And Jesus is gonna to begin to disclose that as what it means to be a citizen in this kingdom of heaven that he has come to establish. So let's start with truth telling. Let's look at Matthew chapter five, verse 33 through 37. I'm gonna read this text for you. It's again, it says again, which if you're paying attention to these scriptures, right? He's saying again, meaning I have just finished giving you a number of examples, right? I've talked to you about anger. I've talked to you about adultery, about divorce. He says, these were all topics that I want you to make sure that your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees. I want you to learn what it means to truly be great in the kingdom of heaven. And in order for that to happen, I'm trying to give you this deeper understanding because I'm after internal you know, uh, commitment, not just an external compliance. So he says this again, 
You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, by the earth, for it is his footstool, which by the way is a quotation from Isaiah chapter 61, where it says, heaven is, you know, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. He goes on and he says, and don't swear by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. And I don't think he was talking about hair dye. I think he was just about willing it one color to another. He says, simply, let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything beyond this, he says, is from the evil one. Now, this could possibly be a take on the third and ninth commandment. The third commandment is, thou shalt not take the Lord thy, that, you know, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. The, ten, the ninth commandment is, that shall, not, that shall not bear false witness against thy neighbor. So this idea of a false witness, it's this idea of putting words in God's mouth or using God as a way of affirming something that I'm saying that's not true, that's just a way of manipulating people into going along with what I'm telling them. You see, this is what Jesus is talking about here. It's taking the name Lord in vain, bearing this false witness. It's a word that appears only once in the New Testament this idea of taking this oath, and it can mean either breaking an oath or to swear falsely. It has a, both connotations to it. What Jesus is saying here is, in, in, uh, when, you, when, you, um, when you begin to, he says you shouldn't swear at all if it's by God's, by heaven or earth, you know, or... Um, or all these various you know, little signs that he's saying, because think about this, what Jesus is saying about truth-telling is that there's no need for any kind of added emphasis for the people of God. I want you to think about this with me for a moment. When you, when you take an oath, when you go through some you know, kind of you know, equation, right, that's just adding emphasis to the fact that I'm telling you the truth. What are you really implying by that then? So when I say, I swear by, and then you throw it in there, and then you speak, does that, am I to gather from that that when you don't use those equations, then maybe you're not telling the truth? So unless I go through this formula, then you shouldn't trust what I say. Is that what we're really saying? Because if you think about it, all of these kinds of ways in which we seek to manipulate, God's saying, you shouldn't, you shouldn't go, and he said, there should be nothing more than a yes for a yes and a no for a no. Anything beyond that, he says, comes from the evil one. There's no need for an added emphasis if you're always gonna tell the truth. So think about that in terms of our own culture. From kids, right? I pinky swear. Or you catch them in a lie and they, and, or, or they're not really fulfilling what they said they were going to do. And they say, well, I had my fingers what? Crossed. Or we, we find ourselves saying like things like, well, I didn't actually say that. Because what you did say was so cleverly you know, defined as to leave these gaping holes so that you're not really gonna be nailed down. It's a fine print in a contract, isn't it? We, we go into a court system and people put their hands on a Bible, even to this day, right? And they say, I solemnly swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God. And then they lie through their teeth. God is saying, like, why do you do that? In the kingdom of heaven, it says it, is, it, it has been part of the Old Testament. 
for people to, to take oaths and, and to, to follow through with them. But he's saying to you and me that the followers of Jesus are to stand by their word and speak the truth at all times. We're to demonstrate to the world an integrity of character such that our word carries with it great, great wealth. Well, great wealth, uh, weight. Because you see, that's the way you're going to be the salt of the earth. You're not going to be diluted. Your, your impact is not going to lose that saltiness, its edge, because you have become too conformed to the world around you. You know, um, boldness, it, it, it comes from sound character. When you want to be bold, now all of a sudden, you're placing yourself in a position for people to take a look at you then, right? This text, Jesus is saying, as the followers of those who are in the kingdom of heaven, your yes should be enough, and your no should be enough. Anything more than that, he says, it leads or it comes from the evil one. Later on in Matthew, Jesus is going to say a couple of things about this. I, I just thought, if, you want, if you're a note taker, you could take this now. Look at Matthew 23 and verse 16. I just want to read it to you so you get the impact of this. Jesus is speaking to the scribes and the Pharisees now, right? These teachers of the law, the ones who are to be instructing Israel in the ways of God. Jesus, when he's the most biting, he's with those who claim to know a lot. Now he brings them close by, and notice what he says to them. He says, woe to you, blind guides. I, I thought they were supposed to be the guides of Israel. Jesus looks at them and says, they're blind guides. You say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. These are the religious leaders of the day who have somehow or another fashioned this whole way of concocting when truth-telling is really truth-telling and when there's a little bit of a, of a hole for us to get through. So if you swear by the temple, that's one thing, but you swear by the gold that's in the temple, that's another. Jesus says, you're a blind fool. Which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? He says, you also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift on it, he's bound by his oath. This, this is commonplace in the days in which Jesus is living. It may sound, you know, simple to us, but just think about all the machinations people go through to write contracts in such a way that could be very, very deceptive. How does that undermine trust? I mean, just listen to the news, man. Like every once in a while, people are just saying something and it's always this spin. It's not a yes is a yes and a no is a no. Jesus calls them blind men, blind guides, blind fools, blind men. Which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. He who swears by the temple swears by it and the one who dwells in it. He who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. Don't play games is what Jesus is saying. If you truly are a citizen of this kingdom of heaven, if your desire is to fix your eyes on him, if your desire is to make sure that your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, if you want to be great in this kingdom of heaven, then you have to, it says, you have to practice these commandments. You have to teach these commandments. And what are they teaching? But loopholes are a way for you to get around it. So that means you could really love God, but you don't have to do this. Really? Did God say that? Or did we say that? Or we act like we're at a spiritual buffet. So I could take a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but I'll leave the rest. Where was that an option? Jesus says, now, the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, is going to disappear until everything is accomplished. 
That's how seriously Jesus took the word. I'm going to give you one more. Ephesians 2, very famous passage that when I start reading it, many of you are going to just resonate with it. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, he says this. As for you, he's speaking to the Ephesian believers, right? He says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Spiritually dead. In which you, what? Used to live. Is that past tense? Yeah, it is, right? So he's making a contrast. He says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed, what? The ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. You see this text that's up on the screen and Jesus says, let your yes be yes, your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. That's what it's saying here in Ephesians. It says we used to live in that, in that realm. All of us also lived at, among them at one time. What? Gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature, following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But, but, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So you see, what does God do through Jesus the Messiah? What is God doing through Jesus the Christ, the anointed one? God's saying, because of what Jesus has done, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he died for us. Why? Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So God, who is rich in mercy, has provided a way for you and I who were far off, dead in transgression, now God is bringing you back in. And it's all not because of your performance, but it's because of God's grace. That's why it goes on to say, in order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us through the Messiah, Jesus. The kindness of God is seen in the very act of Jesus dying on a cross for your sins and mine. It's always a matter of grace, what God is doing. That's why the famous verse, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. This not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is all of grace, but there is a time when we walked contrary to the ways of God, and now because of what God has done in our life, he makes us alive, he raises us up, he sees us in the heavens, so to speak. Because God did something for you when you couldn't do it for yourselves. We walked according to the ways of this world. We were under the influence of this evil one, the spirit, the power of the air who is working in the children of disobedience. We were there doing our own thing, our own way, justifying our ways, perhaps not even really fully being aware of what God, his will was really all about. But now there comes a time when God says, as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, I want you to live life with this internal conviction. And not just take your faith as something that's an external compliance. It's getting heavy, right? I mean, this isn't just like, oh, I love God. No, now he's putting some teeth to that, saying, I want you to examine yourselves because this is what I'm calling you to. This is what it means to be great in the kingdom of heaven. 
This is how your righteousness is going to exceed even the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Then Jesus changes the subject again. Now he's going to give you another illustration of this point. Only this time he's going to use retaliation. Look what he says in verse 38. You have heard that it was said. Right? Here's this common, you know, um, equation again. You've heard that it was said, eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That too is an Old Testament uh, passage. And, um, and in this text, he goes on to say, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Again, throughout this text, Jesus has been using very hyperbolic language, right? If, you, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your hand causes you to sin, chop it off. It, it, it's, it's, it's speaking in hyperbole, right? Just these big statements so that people stop for a moment and they're shocked by what he's saying. But what is he really saying here? I want you to go back for just a second when he says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You know, in the Old Testament, this passage was used to limit the way in people, the way people would um, hand out sentences. It was a way of curtailing so that the punishment would fit the crime. Back in many of the countries of that day, if you stole something, they didn't just cut off your hand, they cut off your head. It was extreme. It was like this one crime, and then we're just going to dump the mother load on this person so that we scare everybody else half to death. God's saying, no, no, it's got to be an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. The Old Testament filter to ensure that the punishment fit the crime, it was to keep injustices from taking over. So now you live with that, and so they're getting a sense, okay, but then Jesus goes on and says, yeah, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. That word resist is a word that speaks, it's a legal term. And so when you add that to if somebody's going to sue you, you begin to see, ah, there's something else that's going on in this environment of people who are suffering some injustices. When he says, if, if, um, if someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the left. I want you to think about something here. Most of the time, when they're talking about right-handedness, right? So if you're going to slap somebody on the right hand, uh, uh, on their right cheek, how are you gonna do that? You can't hit him with an open hand, because if I'm looking at you and I give you an open hand, where am I gonna hit you? What side of your face? On your left side of the face. So how are you slapping somebody on the right cheek? It's with a backhand. What I'm telling you, like this is a little nuance in a culture. Even in our culture to this day, if somebody gives you the back of their hand, doesn't that have a little bit different of a connotation than slapping somebody with an open hand? It was a little bit more what? Insulting, wasn't it? And the same thing when you look at this text, and I want you to think about this. It says when someone wants to sue you, take your tunic. What, what is that? You know, it says, let them have your cloak as well. It's like there is this falseness because this day in court, right, this suing you, there, there, there is, it's a possibility here that people are manipulating a system to just get what they want. And Jesus is saying, look, I want you to stand up against that kind of false witness. Don't play along. Here's the other one, when he says, 
when he goes on, he says, if someone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. The sense of maybe persecution. Kingdom living requires us never to repay the evil for the evil. Do you catch that? The only way to overcome evil is with the good, is what Jesus is saying. And so the citizens of the kingdom of heaven need to pattern their lives so that they are exhibiting a grace-filled life. And what Jesus is saying to you and me is what he's already said. You and I, as followers of Jesus, are going to be insulted at times. You're going to be persecuted at times. People are going to say false things against you. Doesn't that remind you of the text that Jesus just finished saying a little while ago in Matthew 5, 11 and 12? You remember what he said there, right? He said, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Do you notice that the text here is because of me? It's somehow or another you're doing the right things. And these people are trying to manipulate that to their own advantage. That's not a good place to be in, is it? But Jesus said that's what's going to happen when you're following what I'm asking you to follow because it's upside down. It, the world in which we're living thinks you're crazy. Like, why are you doing that? But Jesus knows if you, if you, if you repay evil for evil, you're never going to vanquish evil. A soft answer quiets wrath, right? Come on, we, we know this. You got to de-escalate, not escalate. Jesus is using big language, but the point of it here is the sense of retaliation is, is not really in our hands. He will tell you, like in, uh, in Romans 12, where he says, you know, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. And he says it explicitly there. He says, don't repay evil for evil, but repay evil with good. Notice he goes on, he says, rejoice and be glad. Well, how can I be glad when people are insulting me and persecuting me and, and falsely saying all kinds of evil against me? Because he says, I want you to re recognize that great is your reward in heaven. I want you to recognize that you are walking in a long line of people behind you who lived out the truth and spoke the truth, who received the short end of the stick because they were living life with a kingdom perspective. So what Jesus is saying to those disciples who are around him is what he said in Matthew 5, 11. Only now he's giving them a are a down-to-earth illustration. He's saying it's not just about eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Sometimes God is calling us to demonstrate that we're going to go that extra mile, that we're going to overlook some circumstances here. There was a guy in the church who had put up a basketball court. And um, the neighbor came and, and, uh, and called the police on him because he says that the, 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 the no, I said basketball uh, court, but it, what, now that I remember, the, it wasn't the basketball court. It was that in order to, this was it, in order to get the basketball court on his property, he had a shed and he moved the shed over a little bit so the kids could have a little bit more room to play. And this is in an area where you needed at least two acres, you know, in order to build by the zoning committee. So what he did was he moved the, the shed just a, a couple of feet, and then he put the uh, basketball court there. And the neighbor called the police on him because the shed was on his property no joke, six inches. For him to move the shed, 
it was going to cost them the laborers to come, and they were going to have to come and, you know, pick it up and put it on another little foundation and everything, because that's what he had to pay to have them do it in the first place. Now, at that juncture, he was fuming. He thought, I've been a neighbor to this guy for many years. Never been any trouble, but for six inches, he's going to make me move my shed. And he had a conversation with his wife, and his wife was a little bit more, like, calm, and she just said, honey, we're going to live here for a while. He's going to live there for a while. It's a... It's an expense to us. It's an inconvenience for us. It makes no sense whatsoever. But if you turn this into a big thing, even though he's doing it, you do realize then there's going to be tension between our households and theirs as long as we live here. So we kind of calmed down, and he waited out, and he says, you know what? It's not worth it. And so he just suffered the injustice, brought it back. And lo and behold, if after a number of years go by, he had some really good ministry with this guy and was able to speak into his life on much deeper levels. Maybe that may not have happened if this guy created this big fight over something. See, I think because we have such short-sightedness, like sometimes God wants to do this great work And we're just looking at this moment, and God's looking down the road and saying, do you not realize that repaying evil for evil is never going to accomplish what you think it's going to accomplish? And then when you and I look at the life of Jesus and see how he lived, Jesus saved the world. (laughs) His way is going to win the day. So you might be in this, you might get a victory in this, little battle, but you're going to lose the war. As a citizen of heaven, God is trying to teach us to be the bigger person. Lastly, he's going to talk to us about true love. He says this, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Don't even pagans do that. What Jesus is doing now is saying, people may have said, love your enemy, uh, love, your, love, your, um, love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. But Jesus just redefines love for us. He says, your identity ought to be that of a peacemaker. What does he say? He says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called, what? The sons of God. We're asked to be more kingdom-minded. The tax collectors were despised for contributing to the Roman exploitation of the Jewish people. That was what made Matthew, the tax collector, so offensive because here was a Jew working for the Roman government oppressing the Jewish people. Those of you who have seen that show, The Chosen, right? You know what I'm talking about with Matthew and that, the character that he plays. But notice about something in this text about God's love. In God's love, it says he causes the sun to shine on the just and the unjust. God's given opportunity. He's indiscriminatory. He's going to bless that guy's crops in this one. There's going to come a time for reckoning for all of this. But for now, God has taken the high road, right? He's demonstrated a love that is broader when it talks about my neighbor because he says the sun shines, 
and the rain falls on both the righteous and the unrighteous. So there's one more, one more thing I want you to pick up in this text. And um, it has everything to do with remembering that um, there is a summary now of this greater commandment that we're going to find in verse 48, where Jesus says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. See, that's the conclusion now of all this righteousness that Jesus has been talking about, about anger, adultery, murder, truth-telling, retaliation, and now what it means to be truly this loving person that is emulating the way God is dealing with the world around him. People get hung up on this being perfect thing. But the word for perfect there is just that which could be translated as mature and whole. It's saying that you've grown up, that you're starting to live life the way your heavenly Father has been demonstrating his actions. So if God can deal with the unjust and the unrighteousness in this world, he's saying, I want you to do the same. I want you to be as mature. I want you to grow into this. I know what they've been saying, but this is what I'm saying to you. This was the intention that God had behind all of these commands that he was given to you and to me. Your righteousness, he told us, is to exceed that of the Pharisees and teachers of the law. Because what God is really asking us to do is conform ourselves more and more to the character of God. We're never going to be perfect in that sense, but we can grow up. We can put down deeper roots in our faith. And there's a bunch of ways that God says that in the New Testament. So let me end with this. Very familiar text, um, 1 Corinthians 13. It says, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and could fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Do You notice that the absence of love here it goes from, I become just a big noise. He says, I am nothing, I gain nothing. Because love is not just about words. Love is not just about knowledge. Love is not just about my, 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 my sacrifices. There's tons of people that do a lot of nice things but if I don't do this with this love that's defined by God, that's rooted in a relationship that he has with us through his son, it says I gain nothing. That's pretty hard to kind of take, isn't it? Until you read what the definition of love is as he gives it. Because from this, it goes on, and then you've heard this text before, right? Where it says love is patient and love is kind. It doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, it's not proud. It's not rude, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Love, it says, protects, it trusts, it hopes, it perseveres. Love never fails. See, this is what it means to be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Love one another deeply from the heart. But notice this love is not a, it's, it's not a noun. It's not spoken of in terms of emotion. No, this love is a verb. It's an action word. It's something that we're being asked now to do. And this love is always directed to another person. 
How can you show love? You, you show love by being patient. You love show by being kind to someone. You, you, you're not envious. You're not boastful. You're not proud. You're not rude. You're not self-seeking, easily angered. You're not keeping a record of wrongs. Isn't that what Jesus has just been saying to us in this text? The call of God on a follower of Jesus is to emulate more and more about the life of Jesus because that's the language that's going to be spoken in the kingdom of heaven. And when you start to really think about that, then you begin to realize more and more how the clutches of this world, man, are so deeply wrapping their hearts around, uh, wrapping their, their, their arms around us. which should make us all the more grateful that we have someone like Jesus who demonstrated this in perfection, who died for you because you could never do it on your own. But he says, now that you know me, and now that my spirit is in you, how about we go about this life a little bit different? Now you realize when he says, those who are great in the kingdom of heaven are those whose mind and whose heart have been transformed, shaped by this word, because it'll never leave you as you are. You and I will be changed and conformed more and more into the image of Jesus. It'll affect your temper. It'll affect your sexual libido. It'll affect your marriages, your homes. It'll affect the way in which you seek to retaliate, tell the truth, show love, Because God is making you into a different person so that your righteousness would exceed that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law so that you would be great in the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for these passages that um, speak to some of the most contemporary issues that we face. We live right now in a day and an age where people are so angry. So much immorality. Where people are seeking justice on their own. Where we have lost some of the civility. And we've turned love upside down. Lord, help us to really hear your voice, that it would change us. So as we're planted in the world, we do continue to become that salt of the earth and light of the world. Men and women that you can use and point to as illustrations of your grace. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.